Hey, uh, please do remain calm. About to run against it and with a little bit of soul, no time. Welcome to the Please Remain Calm podcast. I am Ben Gonzalez. And I'm Daniel Gonzalez. And we are here with our guest, Richard Trapp. Yo, yo. How you doing, sir? Very good to be in the building. Glad we, to have you here. Another Venice guy. Another Venice guy, yeah. Sir, Venice um, heavy episode. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the more interesting, crazy stories that we're going to hear on good old Peter. See this here. one is going to be uh, fun. Uh, point out again. Rock and sweats for this is what the fifth show in a row. Yeah, he heard it's a he, mandate now. He well, he heard something on the internet, something about guys in gray sweats. So he's been wearing nah, them every day, and, and I'm promoting it <laughs> oh, at the top right. of every episode. He's been wearing them every day, <laughs> top of every episode. Sashays his way into the <laughs> two, studio. Two two different pairs, <laughs> so a, a lighter shade and a darker shade. Gray you know is a bold move. Hey, before we get going here today, I, I just want to off the top of the bat. All the op opinions expressed here are our own. They do not reflect the opinions of the Los Angeles City Fire Department or the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. Just to get that out of the way, since we're always waiting, we're always tagging with that at the very end just to cover our ass, but we'll knock it out in the beginning here. <laughs> yeah, we did. We haven't done that at the beginning in God, no, 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 God no. knows how long. I figured we get out of the way. Yeah. All right, so let, let's jump into this because uh, yeah, I don't even know how, how we start this because it's weird. I, I think you should say how, should we say how you reconnected and then get to the backstory? I think we'll start here. All right. Being a firefighter, and I said this on my Instagram when I when I ran across right. uh, so Richard, Richard's something. story. <laughs> being a firefighter and paramedic or a police officer, you know, to a certain extent, being in an emergency service like, like, like this, it's a trip, man, for a lot of different reasons. You see a lot of crazy things you see a lot of people in their worst possible moment especially with the fire department i mean the police department you got someone breaking a law you got somebody assaulting you or something like that you're the pretty specific set of things that you get called out for the fire department is kind of like a catch-all mm. you know what i mean like yeah. like uh shit we don't know you know my cat's stuck in the tree well who the hell do you call for that well i'm gonna call the fire department mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah. uh there's whatever yeah there. there's i i can hear something you know, in the woods behind my house. <laughs> Shit, okay. We'll call the fire department, you know? Mm -hmm. I think there might be, you know, a car over the... It's whatever. It's whatever the hell it could be. So you get there, you, 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 you try to remember all the hours and hours and hundreds of hours of training that you've done on all kinds of different shit because you never know what the hell you're going to get called out to help, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you figure out, what you got and what's the best route to take to remedy the situation. You yeah. put a Band-Aid on whatever it is and you get them going to, if it's a patient, you get them going to definitive care where they're going to get the help they need. Yeah. If it's a fire, you put the damn fire out. If it's an earthquake, whatever. That the is the way that every single run is the same. You, okay. you got to figure out what it is. What can you do? What are you going to do? And you leave that incident and, you, you know, we have critiques afterwards. We'll do with incident stress debriefings if it's a critical incident you know a kid died or some you know a mass casualty incident or you know a terrible fire where one of our guys got hurt or something like that and you break down the incident you critique but that's usually about as far as it goes the department will write up a green sheet if it's something significant but you don't really get to follow a patient into the hospital see what their outcome is uh, unless they actively come right. and, and seek you out, right. you know, to say, Hey, you guys saved my life or, yeah. Hey, thanks for doing this. Or, Hey, you worked on my grandma or whatever. Yeah. Once they get off your gurney, that's a wrap for you. Right. So to open Instagram, <laughs> okay. A week or so ago. And, uh, I've, you know, most of you guys know, I run the, the 63's page for, for the, for the, uh, 63's Instagram page for our fire station. And uh, I get tagged on uh, one of Rich's posts. And I get tagged on a lot of, or, uh, the page, the 63's page gets tagged a lot. You know, people snap a picture of the engine or the rescue driving by, Something you know, because it looks is, cool. Yeah. And so when I first saw it, I didn't think much of it, and then I bring it up and I start reading, and I get about three sentences in, and it dawned on me what the call was, <laughs> and that I was on the call. Amazing. That he was talking about. Um. 
I think we start from the beginning, man, yeah. and we'll and we'll work our way to the sure. incident. But that's um, the point. Th- there is that's how you guys found each other. That's how, how we found each other, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Richard's uh, patient that I had, uh, that we shared this this moment. That um, you know, for me at the at the time, and and, and this is why I think this episode is going to be so interesting, man, because. I've been doing this a long time, 20 years as a, as a medic, you know, 18 on the fire department. And, um, I understand that when I get called out to an incident, no matter what the incident is. And just like I said earlier, it could be fucking anything. Okay. I understand that when I get there, this is that person's emergency. You know, Mm. this is a point in their life that they, they needed help to the point where they pick up the phone and call 911. Uh, you know, uh, there's there are some people that call nine one one for every little tiny thing, uh, but usually for, to pick up the phone and call nine one one for help. I mean, that's a significant thing that's going on in mm-hmm. someone's life. So I always try to approach it with that kind of respect. You know, I don't care why you're in this situation. I've seen people in the most compromised situations wearing the most oh. compromised <laughs> things. You know what I mean? So yeah, pretty I tr- much, yeah. I try not to judge. I try to just come in and do my job. And get you on your way, get you to the hospital, get you the help you need. And I say, I usually, you know, leave a patient in the hospital room and say, "Hey, buddy, good luck. I hope you feel, I hope you feel better." Mm-hmm. And that's the end of it, you know. Um, and and so, but at, at the same time, from your point of view, this is a turning point in your life that, oh, that we're going to talk it's about. It's the here. one and only nine one one call that I made. It's crazy. That's it. Yeah. So, just interesting how those, how yeah. first of all, how these two things diverge, yep. and then. When we're all done, we got to talk about just the little similarities and people that we know and stuff yeah. like that I've run into. But yep. yeah, let's start, a fun pre-interview. <laughs> yeah, let's start from the beginning. Yeah. Um, did you grow up in Southern California? Or? I'm originally from Cincinnati, but I grew up, um, I was born in a small Adams County, Ohio. My parents were premies of the Guru Maharaji, and I grew up on a strawberry farm. Oh, wow. Until I was six. So I grew up around hippies. It was almost like an ashram and uh y- you know i grew up in this in this community with you know two moms and a dad which i thought was normal as a kid um and yeah. no tv just like a little hippie strawberry kid nice um, a little wild man uh like and a that, wild wild country yeah kind of thing, huh? yeah you, you watch yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what i'm saying it's right, exactly it makes you like yeah. that so i used to go to these huge gatherings where maharaji would would preach or speak and you know, it'd be in a big stadium and we would go in all dressed in white and he would talk and he was funny. Even as a kid, I liked him. I just liked his vibe. And uh, at the end of his thing, he would spray the entire audience with uh, like tie dye sparkle with like a fire hose, literally a fire hose. Yeah. And so everyone would leave tie dyed and like spark. And that's, you know, that was kind of the, my, my baseline. Yeah. Uh, and you're a kid up. and you're yeah. like, holy shit, yeah. this is awesome. Yeah. And then we moved to Cincinnati when I was six and then moved in like into kind of the hood like under like a coke dealer like four in the morning doom 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 cockroaches single mom like getting beat up you know learned how to pop lock like you know i was a little b-boy when i was like six you know man what a change yeah yeah (laughs) so from yes hippie strawberry to like street kid you know man that's crazy (laughs) just like that huh yeah just like that um how old were you when you got here to uh, Southern California? I Venice? moved here uh, in 97, and my folks moved to the Bay when I was 18. So, you know, the formative years were in Cincinnati, but I always, you know, my cousins lived in Escondido and then uh, La Mesa and San Diego. My step family um, lived in Santa Monica. So my mom worked for American Airlines, and I, I came out to California once a month, I mean, my whole life, just oh, really? okay. always coming out here. So it was kind of like, it was just a natural progression. You know uh, what I mean? How old I were you just, in 97? How old were you? Um, I was 21, oh, okay. 22, right, right, out, right after young, college. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I, I'm yeah. sorry, can I peel it back though? Yeah. Why'd you leave the uh, the ashram? Like what happened? Well, my my folks split up uh, okay. and uh, and that was that. It, you know, every, everybody kind of scattered to the wind. Um, uh, yeah, but so my dad was like the he he started the Divine Light Mission in the United States. So at one point, Maharaji had a fleet of seven forty sevens. I was going to say, he's big, right? Of acolytes. Yeah. He still has a house up in Malibu. Like right. He's still yeah. So it is like that that documentary. It was 
a mini version of that. It's so crazy, man. <laughs> so what? So was it just like one parent stayed and you went with the parent that left? I they were no, both everybody, like, everybody, everybody, everybody scattered. Oh, okay, My, the whole the, compound kind of broke up. Well, the, it was. The, it wasn't really like a compound. It was just our family, but we always had. Like my aunt and uncle lived on a school bus in the front for a while. And then, you know, Pat Shannon, this traveling salesman lived with, there was just all yeah. these people Just a little hippie there. community, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It was in the seventies? Almost like Lucky yeah. Cheetah. I was born in 75. So this was 75 to 80, 81. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Dude. That's yeah. crazy, man. Yeah. Shit. Um, it's a cool scene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sounds like it. What got you into music? Was it being there? I mean, there's a lot of like drum circles and I shit was, there. Or it, yeah, was it well, the, uh, you know, guy? they were really into like you know all the you know um, the Doors, Led Zeppelin, um, Simon and Garfunkel, all that stuff. So I grew yeah. up with no TV and just records. And I was a little performer from the time I was a kid. We used to put on the Blues Brothers record, and I would put on my dad's suit and like yeah, do the dances dance. today. Yeah, yeah, I did all the dances and perform. Now. I thought I was a genius and hilarious. Turns out, I think they were probably a little stone, <laughs> and there was no other entertainment, so yeah, the bar yeah. was like, low. Hell yeah, get your yeah. kid. But got Wake me. your kid up. Throw some glitter on him. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, two little kids that get are the, willing to get, perform. Get the glitter dancing kid. <laughs> right. That's right. And they would. They'd be like, "Do your thing." I'd be uh, like, all right, what do you yeah. want me to do? Man. But then my mom married my stepdad. Uh, they met when I was like seven or eight, and my stepdad is. Um, was the uh, principal double bass player for the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Oh, wow. wow. So then I was just like blasted. I was always a music kid, always had rhythm, always gravitated towards it, but that kind of like was it, you know what I mean? Hey, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm retarded. Double bass, I'm thinking like a like a like a bass but with like two necks or something. Well, like, what are we it's, talking about? It's is this a giant giant it's, bass or it's what? It's technically called it's that stand up bass that right. you're used yeah, to yeah, seeing. Yeah, yeah. It's technically called a double bass. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Here we have learned as the more you know. Right <laughs> bass. <laughs> Those things are cool, man. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I, mean. I thought it was something like yeah. the one with two necks. Like, Damn, this is a stepdad. Yeah. Which I bet it is somewhere. That'd yeah, be right? cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the that was kind of the the seed of that, you know. Was your thought when you moved here to uh, like SoCal to Venice, were, were your thoughts in the music world? Is um, that what were you thinking about doing? I got because you do that now, right? That's, yeah, that's your profession now. Yeah, I do that. I do voiceovers. Um, I, I and you do what kind of music do you do? So I, for years, have been. Um, so we played in a big hip hop orchestra called Daka. So for twenty plus years, we've played everywhere from. We started out at like the Temple Bar, the Conga Room back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we played like Walt Disney Concert Hall, Hollywood Bowl. Like we got, nice. it got pretty big. Oh wow! Seventy-two piece hip hop orchestra, bananas. So a lot of live stuff like that. And then from Jump, from like '99 on, I started doing. Um, you know, when they want like a hip hop song for the background of a TV show, they mm -hmm. can't afford Jay Z. And they do kind of, they're like, well, this one sounds like, and it's a lot less expensive. My, I have a friend that does that because I myself used to rap. Come and, on. Uh, the dude that was my hey. producer in like uh, 05, 06, that's what he does now. It's a company it's called uh, Signature Tracks. Oh, they do all the oh, yeah. music for like uh, like BT, BT, Bravo, VH1 I shows. I think I've heard of that signature. Yeah. 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 So we caught, I caught some real, uh, some real nice initial placements. Um, there was this James Cameron show with Jessica Alba, that was All our right. first placement. And then there was a show called Prison Break. Yeah, yeah And Prison I had a Break. big hit off of that, which was a hit, you know, just in a very small circle at the time because there was no Instagram, no Spotify. Yeah. Um, that now has like two million plays on Spotify. It's called Willing to Die. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and I that that rap moniker is under St. John, which is one of my middle names is Sinjin, but it's spelled St. John. So I got real lucky and I could, I could flip different styles. I could write fast. Um, wasn't afraid of the mic. Could turn it around quick, and you know, could play the role. And no one would ever know. So you hear me rapping in yeah. the background, and you don't think it's some tall, goofy white dude. You know, it's yeah, got yeah. some. This kid's got flows. You know, so I yeah. got to play yeah, right, different right, roles. Right. You know, yeah, yeah super yeah. fun. Yeah, super that's awesome, fun. man. Yeah. How soon after you got here did you get into doing that on uh, well, TV and stuff? Um, that was I started doing that like ninety eight, ninety nine. But I came out here to act because I got a I got an acting scholarship and went to school for theater at Ohio University. Oh, okay. So like trained theatrical actor, and did a lot of stuff. Did a ton of um, you know national commercials. 
um, was in like little little roles in like Cradle to the Grave and sure, like sure, yeah. you know B movies like The Convent, which Coolio was in yeah. and Adrian Barbeau. Um, so little stuff like that, and then guest stars and all this, and so it was kind of hitting my stride, you know. Yeah, um, right. Life life of a of of an actor, but like was getting some good stuff between that and the music was starting to really. Um, and then I started bartending. And then the 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 fit stoner guy because I was a I was a real heavy kid, but but the athletic you know played sure. thirteen seasons of soccer swam played football da 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 right, but right. big you yeah. know, and then in college I lost all the weight got super skinny and fit and like marathon guy yeah yeah you know, so that guy lasted for a long time and was kind of a stoner wheatgrass you know and and then started bartending and then the the thing that is in our family, good Irish Catholic family ah. that likes to have a tip or two, Yeah, uh -huh. uh, bit me, you know, and it started, sure. and that started. Especially the, night after night, oh. you know, and being in the party like that. And just getting, you know, I, I I never wanted to go fast, but then it started getting handed these packages, and, you, and I started going fast, and I had three yeah. girlfriends in a row that liked going fast too. So. Yeah, it's a lifestyle change. It is, yeah. yeah. So, were you working uh, aside from the bartending? Yeah. Were you working regularly with music at the same time as well? Yeah, yeah. I was. So I would get like you know the whole time the the whole time this is happening, I'm making stuff for for TV that is living. You know, I've now after 20 years made a hundred songs and been on you know CSI, uh -huh. Modern Family, The Wire. I have 20 cues on The Wire. No one oh, would wow. ever know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, nice. so that was always a nice route. Um, and then started doing voiceovers back in the day when I would do like jingles and in between the jingles, they'd be like, Hey, can you just read this copy? And I would read it and it would turn into a thing. So just, yeah. and that's, that was my whole life was just stumbling into sure. stuff. I was a lot of people always real lucky. A lot of people yeah. don't realize how much of Hollywood how mm -hmm. how much that is in Hollywood, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, it's and I didn't care. Right place, like, right time. Like it was shit. it was fun, and it was what I wanted to do. But I didn't care. I didn't make the. I wasn't like, I wasn't go. I wasn't a hard worker at it. You know. Yeah. I was just like lucky. Yeah, but it was yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah it exactly. Was happening. It's all yeah. that matters. Yeah. So you get to where? At, at what point? Yeah. yeah. Like how long ago? How many years ago would you say that? The, the turning point happened where you started kind of going downhill. So I, I started in like probably like 2003, 2004, 2005, really bartending a lot, really drinking a lot, really partying a lot. And um, it just kept going in these cycles of like, I would just go on these crazy runs and then I'm an extreme person, so then I would go the opposite. My friends would always be like, yeah. are you like running a marathon and just juicing now, or are you like doing cocaine and eating steak? Like where, are you a vegan, it was one or of the, are yeah. you eating bacon One extreme time? or the next, yeah. Always, yeah. It was yeah. cycles. That's it, yeah. 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 So I started around then, you know, um, it just, it really started to, I just caught the bug, you know, and I just, and I didn't want to stop. Like I was, the party was great. Until, yeah, you know, until it wasn't. Until and apparently, wasn't, yeah. looking back on it now, it wasn't that great. You know, sure. it seemed fun at in the, time. the moment, though. Yeah, like, yeah. Hey, let's go. Yeah, but like I had, you know, I I signed with William Morris and you know booked some really great like roles and had a few pilots. Like I was the star of a pilot. So like, and then I just threw it. I just threw it all away. Got dropped by them. I just you know, and it just started just started burning down you know how long um how long from when you realized that oh shit i might have an issue here yeah to when you were dropped by your agent dropped by before you I started mean, seeing the actual dominoes start to tumble the night before i i had a really great um uh, manager um who i still who who when i came back uh, who i was telling you earlier like hooked me up you know with my new voiceover agent right, still right. in the mix great guy brian dobbins and um he set me up with um i think it was the william moore i think it was the initial like group like introduction like do we want to work together sure the night before that i stayed up till 5 a.m i really liked this one girl mm -hmm. and i was just like yeah but I was like a marathon runner at the time. So I got I knocked out for a few hours, 
was like power through 24 yeah. 25 yeah. and just was like so there were no consequences sure yeah but i i started to realize and all of this stuff i would constantly put myself in positions of success and then sabotage myself right mm. something about that pattern was like i i knew something was not right about that but i always tried to overcorrect the other way and then would just you know just back and forth and back and forth and i would take time off too i was always taking like nine months off of drinking but i would smoke right. weed or like eight months off of everything yeah. or like not drink but do coke which is not the yeah. best combo yeah. ever yeah, but then yeah. it could justify you to go back to it because you're like man i've been kicking ass for six months there you I'm go party I'd, i earned it that's yeah. it yeah. well it's just so crazy the level at which you bargain with yourself Oh, when, yeah. when you're in that situation, That's you know, exactly right. you, you know, in the back of your mind that it's all bad, That's right? <laughs> it's yes. all got it's bad, but this is, the, this is the yeah. least bad one. So I'm going to, I'm going to put off all these, but I'm still going to do this. I mean, right. it's, and then you do that for, until you realize that it's all this, it's all the fucking same. See, right? And it's a trip too, because you guys are in different paths or different parts of the same town yeah. mm -hmm. going through pretty much like the same kind of thing. That's yeah, right. Bit, cycling man. one way, <laughs> yeah. correcting, cycling and correcting. Yeah. And then, you know, when you hit a, a low yeah. health wise as well, yeah. then, yeah. you com then you converge. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling so that's you, it's a trip. It's, it's, it is it a trip, man. It really and it's, is. So let, let, let's get toward the convergence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, you, you, so now you're in the point. So now you're an LA native. You're 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 ingrained in LA. Yeah. You've been working, you know, uh, in Hollywood. You've got music going. You're bartending. You got a couple girls that are kind of leading you down the wrong path. At what point does that snowball get too big? I mean, like, uh, do, do do you do you recall? I mean, was the day we met the day that you realized that that it, it was too much to deal with, or was it before? Did you see it coming? It was. It's it's so interesting because the the writing was on the wall for so long, um, but I had to push myself to such an extreme to to get to where I got. You know what I mean? I couldn't. And I couldn't stop, you know, I used to, I would carve stuff on the, I have these shelves above my bathroom and I would carve, like, get your shit together. I would like, I really was, you know, I, I really was ready to, to stop it, but I was just in such the grips of, of yeah. this affliction, you know, that they call it a disease of alcoholism, but I, I call it an affliction cause I'm just a fiend, you know what I mean? Yeah. Doesn't matter what it is on an Island, I'll find something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So it was that that long, and I kept trying to pull myself back. And then the last year and a half, you know, I blew up. I probably gained 150 pounds in like very short amount of time. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was in, and I was like actively trying to fill some kind of hole. You know, there was a nurse at uh, at Rancho Los Amigos. The second place I went to is a physical rehabilitation place, mm -hmm. and uh, she's a Jamaican nurse, and she had that 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 juju that sixth sense yeah and she said uh she said why you want to kill yourself and i said i said i i don't know and she said you want to kill someone but you can't kill them so you try and kill yourself and like something about yeah. that was one of those moments that clicked in me because i was trying to do something i was trying to hurt somebody or something and it turns out it was i was the only thing so when people talk about suicide and they talk about all this stuff like I was trying to kill myself. It was just a long, slow sure, yeah. thing. You know what I mean? And that last, you know, the last night before I called, um, I was I was sleeping sitting up. Because if I, I knew in my mind, if I just leaned over, it'd be it. Done deal. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wake All up. All that fluid, yeah. 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 So you, you say you put on a buck 50 in a year. So I was... I was, you know, on my own 427. And then the scariest thing was, and the reason I called 911 was, I took a few days off. I was driving for Uber at the time. Mm -hmm. And I took a few days off. And in that few days, I stayed up in my room and drank and did my thing. And then one day I, I made my way down to my, I was driving like a Honda CRV, I think. And I went to go get a coffee. And I got to get in and I could, I could barely get in my door and I scraped my testicles on the seat 
And that's what happened where I got back in and they, and they, uh, you know, they, right. sw- I they swelled up yeah. and I couldn't walk. That's why I called 911. But it, it, that fluid came on so fast. So I was already 427. And then within the span of, I mean, there was probably already a baseline of 50 to 100 pounds of fluid over a few weeks. But the last 200 pounds of fluid came on in days. I mean, it was so scary. I wow. didn't know what was happening. I couldn't taste salt. I couldn't, there was all these, you know, the morning of, I kept asking my roommate to get me ice. I was like, get me, we ran out of ice. I just needed, I couldn't get enough. And my body was just like, you know, and it was shutting down, you know? So on top of my 427 pounds of natural weight, I had 300 pounds. So when I called 911, I was like, you know, I think I'm around 400 some pounds. I didn't, I was estimating, which was right. But At the time, I didn't, yeah. I didn't sure. take into account the 300 pounds of water weight. So when you Over guys came and saw days, me, yeah. it was 727 So pounds. there was a breakdown of your systems from how, how you were living. Right. Triggered the Anasarca, and mm-hmm. then you added an extra 300 pounds yeah. in a matter of in my, three days? They, yeah. Well, the, the week, majority or? of it came in like a week. Oh, okay. I mean, it just came right, so just, fast yeah. that, that it was like baffling to me in my car after like three I was like- so, yeah, I was going to say, you kind of just like wake up and you're so, just noticing yeah. more and more when you were already big to begin with. And you don't hear about this because people don't, first of all, because I'm I'm a tall dude and I have a tall frame, I could take mm-hmm. on a lot. Yeah. But you don't hear about this much weight coming, yeah. this much water weight coming on this fast. And then sure. you definitely don't hear about it coming off because people die. Yeah. Exactly. Because at your uh, like fit weight or whatever, you were walking around like 250, 275 or so? I mean- when I was marathon guy, I was down to 185, 190. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. Um, so we're talking about it, over 500 pounds. Yes. And yeah. so, yeah. so yeah. same man. That's right. Wow. <laughs> so I happened to be on the truck that day. Uh, uh, normally I'm assigned to the paramedic rescue. Yeah. When we have another, when we have an extra, like a paramedic from another station gets hired in a fireman spot, as a courtesy, typically that guy will ride the rescue because it's busier. Oh. And one of the rescue guys will get to be a fireman for the day. Interesting. So I happened to be on the truck that day and uh, we were out on the, out in the uh, radio. So we were out in the district when we got the call with the rescue and we got there first. So we get the box and everything, and we get the note that patient is. It was we got it as a sick. Okay, when when they don't know what to put, they put sick. Yeah. It was a sick person. Sick person. There. I think yeah. that sums it up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <laughs> and it said in the notes, patient states he's five hundred pounds. Okay, not com- not abnormal. Yeah. I mean, it happens. We get heavy wow. patients all the time. Okay, wow. get there. What what apart what apartment is it? Uh, it's probably on the second. Yep, second floor. Of course. Fuck. Of course. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> If they're over 300 pounds, they're always on the second floor, okay? So the, oh, as we're walking up, that's the first thought. It's like, <laughs> son of a bitch, he's on the second floor. Okay. <laughs> so we get up there, wa- uh, you know, open the door, and Rich is sitting there on uh, on his couch or a chair in the living room there. And basically tells me what he just said, basically. Uh, man, I've been going at it. You know, I've been, there was a few empty bottles of, of vodka around. <laughs> been going at it. Uh, s- couldn't be nicer. Couldn't be more polite. I'm really sorry, guys. You know, uh, I just I've gained so much weight. I don't know if I. And then talked about you know scraping your 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 nuts, and uh, you're like, I don't think I can walk because they swelled up. All right, let me take a look. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Those are swollen. And I was yep. wearing a sheet around me, and they and you guys go, Man. let's see it. Now that was the end of my. I go. All right. Yeah. I mean, I haven't walked in on well. 700 pound version of you, but <laughs> many other versions of oh, you. Yeah. Guy in a sheet sitting. Yeah. And and. <laughs> Hey, yep. I hurt my nuts. My nuts are swollen. It ain't the first first time I heard that either. I yep. mean, I've seen elephantitis of wow. the penis, elephantitis in the nuts. Sure. I've been swelling a lot in the of nuts. Stuff, man. Whew. I've seen it all, dude. So when I when I say twenty, you know, eighteen years as a medic for for LA City Fire, mm-hmm. working Skid Row and South Central, I've seen it all. So mm-hmm. to me, it was just like, all right, I'm just trying to find out what we're dealing with. Sure. Because let's say you did slice your scrotum open or right. something. Like that. That's a whole nother problem that sure. we have to solve before we worry about even yep. getting you downstairs, totally. right? Um, you know, if you have other traumas, if you have a sore on your ass because you've been sitting on the couch mm-hmm. for uh, you know four months or something like that, mm-hmm. I gotta check that too because that's gonna affect 
the pain you're in. Right. Uh, I also have to give a full report. I also have to determine what hospital I'm going to take you to. So getting a full picture of what I'm dealing with as a medic wow. is is it, it, super important yeah. to, to get a baseline of what I'm dealing with. Yeah, right. Um, I also got to get a baseline set of vitals. I also got to get a baseline EKG on you, especially with someone as heavy as you were yep. at that time, um, especially with your complaint. I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I'm dying, right? And my chest is hurting. It's hard to breathe. It's like kind of the full gamut mm. of, of complaints to have. That's what I said. I felt like I was dying. I felt like, I feel like, I'm, I feel like I'm dying, man. Wow. I feel like I'm dying. I can't breathe. I don't Does your chest that. hurt? Yeah, my chest hurts a little bit. Okay. All right. So I got to I got to get all the baseline stuff to determine w what the hell I'm going to do with the rest of this call. Yeah. When we have somebody who and as far as I remember all of your vitals were pr pretty pretty well within normal limits. I'm 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 sure your blood pressure was was high, but mm -hmm. your EKG was okay. Everything seemed like it was okay to the yeah. point where we could like Take a step back and like, all right, there's nothing life threatening here. Let's figure out how we're gonna get him downstairs. Yeah. Right. So anytime we have a patient upstairs, we have a uh, we have a chair called it. It's called a stair chair, yeah. specifically designed for bringing people downstairs. Mm -hmm. Right. It's actually, thank God that we have this new generation of stair chairs because we used to it used to just literally be a chair with four handles that yeah, everybody flipped had up. To hold it. Yeah. And you'd have four guys that would just grab a handle and we pick pick people up and take them. You know, down the stairs. Whew. We had a lady once, just kind of side story. We had a lady once stair chair uh, when I worked at 61s, which is actually right down the street here. There's the, those towers here. What's that? Those towers over here where all the actors yeah. live? Park La Brea. Park La Brea. Yeah. Got a call to Park La Brea. The, the elevators were out. Mm. This little old lady, 65 years old, had gone to the market and came back. She had bags of groceries. She lived on the 10th floor <laughs> and the elevators were out. And uh, so we're like, screw it. We threw her on the stair chair and <laughs> carried her up to her apartment with all her. But but that goes right back to what I'm saying, right? What people call when they don't know what who, who else to call. Yeah, who do exactly. I call wow. to help this lady get back in her this apartment? Is blowing yeah. my mind. You know, four firemen carried her up 10 flights of stairs to her apartment and then one guy in the back with her groceries. But <laughs> but that used to be our stair chair. So wow. anyways, the the stair chairs that we have now, they're a chair, but on the on the back, there's a like a track, almost like a tank track right. that flips down at a at a uh, 45 degree angle or whatever angle the stairs are at. And that track catches and rolls down the edge of each step, if that makes sense. So it's not going yeah. down the stairs. It's just kind of gliding down the edges of each step, right? right? Like if like if you took a box and laid it down and slid it down, yeah, the, right, uh, right, it's right. kind of like that. But it's a track that has friction on it so that this it, it, it goes down slowly mm -hmm. and one guy in the back kind of just holds it and it just kind of slowly just dunk, goes dick, down. Dick, dick, dick. okay yeah. <clears throat> hold that thought <laughs> rich was big enough where i had concerns about that chair because it's a normal sized chair right and usually the the issue with big people is not so much their weight because our gurney will hold 750 pounds or whatever it is. I was going to say, do you guys just have the bariatric gurneys in all the rigs anyway? Or? Uh, now we're getting to that point. So okay. the, wow. the gurneys, the, 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 our regular gurneys hold seven, se about 750 pounds. Okay. Uh, the bariatric gurneys hold not very much more. I think it's only like 800 pounds. I was going to say, I didn't know the regular gurneys yes. held that much. I thought but, the regular gurneys were like 350 or something. It's the body surface area. That's right. That, that's the issue. Ah, because it's they just won't super fit. wide. Yeah, they won't fit in the regular yep. gurney. So, ah. the, so the, the, the heavy lift gurneys, right, or bariatric gurneys, they're just wider and they don't have side rails. Ah. So, so it's just a matter of of having more space to put mm -hmm. the patient on. Not really what the what the and so they're able to drape out a little more. Right. So yeah. now they have the, now instead of having a completely separate group, because then the problem inherent problem with that was having when you put the gurney in the back of the ambulance, there's brackets in there that hold the whole thing in place. Well, when you put the bariatric gurney in, it's different brackets. So if you had somebody mm. who was heavy. And the only reason I know so much about this is because I've worked at every single fire station. That every seemed like every fire station I worked at had one of these bariatric gurneys. But mm. you would you would get a call like let's say if I was when I was working at sixty one. Oh, so you have to take the brackets out and put other brackets in. We'd be eating lunch at Whole Foods and we'd get a call for a shortness of breath heavy lift patient in South Central. 
We'd have to come uh, leave Whole Foods, you have the, go yeah. back to 61s. Everyone would come out, and we'd unscrew the brackets, put the new bracket in, put the bariatric gurney in, and Man. then light it up and head down to South Central. Wow. 20, 30 minutes to get there. to, And then have to worry about getting this five, six, seven hundred pound person wow. onto the gurney. So I have a lot of experience with with heavy patients. Okay, yeah. I mean I've been doing it around the city. For, uh, I, Fire Station Ten, I worked there for years. Sixty Ones, I worked there for years. I've done it all over the city. So when I saw you, my first thought was, he's too fucking big for the for the stair chair. He's too right. big for the stair chair. The only other option we have at that point is something called a sked. Okay, basically, essentially, what the sked is is a heavy gauge piece of plastic essentially okay um that we use for like uh if we if we're doing a litter basket rescue over a hillside or something like that mm. it's made to have somebody on a backboard wrapped completely in it cinched down with straps that you can strap a rope to and lower the person down wow. or lift them up sliding up the side of a hillside or like something a like that. mega tarp Kind of like a super heavy duty mega mover, mega tarp. Okay. So the, uh, the, uh, the thought, this is outside of your apartment as we're talking about how to get you down was we got to get the sked in here. Hmm. We'll get them down on the, we'll just, that's another thing too, is getting you from where you're sitting up right. and onto a gurney has its own difficulties, right. right? Especially if your patient's not able to stand at all on their own. It's extremely difficult to lift dead weight yep. on a person. Oh, man. Oh, okay? God, yeah. Especially 727 pounds of dead weight. So a lot of times we'll put the gurney on the ground and just flop somebody down onto the gurney and then adjust them on the gurney. You know, it's easier to let gravity just help you out and slide them and flop yeah. them down somewhere, mm -hmm, right? So totally. <laughs> our thoughts were if we get the sked in here on the ground, put a couple pillows so he doesn't hurt himself and just flop him down off of the, off of the couch onto the sked, we can wrap them, tie so rope, and the then sked down? three of us Everybody's can slide. Exactly, <laughs> three of us can Man. slide the sked down. Wow. We'll aim him feet first down the stairs, and we'll hook up a little lowering rope system and just slide him down the stairs. Can we just point out the range of meetings that Rich has had about himself in his life, <laughs> from William Morris to Truck Sixty Three working out the sked? Yeah, dude. Right? Yeah, that man. is real, man. You know what I mean? Not a lot of people can say that. That's right. That you know? is real. Not a lot of people can say that, dude. Um, some, some movie. <laughs> so, those are the conversations going wow. on outside. You know, while the guys are inside trying to get you ready to to go. Yeah. And um, you know the the we we. We called for a heavy lift gurney, and then, um, uh, you know, just everyone looking at it, they were like, well, let's try the stair chair. Let's try it. Let's see if we can get him in it. Okay. Got him in, sitting in it. Like, okay, well, he's sitting on it. All right, good. Let's, uh, let's you know, see how we do it. So we got him rolling. That thing sits straight up, you know, as you're rolling him down. So we roll him down the, uh, you know, the outside little um, balcony there to the top of the stairs. And just like I said, it it's designed to roll on the on the corner of mm -hmm. the of the right, step, right. right? All the way down. Okay. You dented the stairs. Is that where that's from? Yeah. You dented the stairs that day. I've seen that chunk and yes. I've always gone, I wonder where that came from. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> wow. edge, the edge of the stairs, as we start going down. <laughs> crunched Ooh. in those landlords listening now yeah and so, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're uh, i mean really to the point where it was like fuck it damn is this gonna work and then and then the tread's gonna caught. cave in yeah dude it's a i mean you're dealing with it's a lot of weight you never man. know it's yeah. a lot of weight yeah and because all you guys uh, are on it too you know and stairs are made to be stepped on top you know what i mean they're mm. not made to be used in that way right. really right and so um, it was a concern at first, and then the tracks s caught, and it, and he slowly started. Going, and it was like, okay, he's coming down. And then, um, yeah, and then got you know got him onto the gurney. I think. Hold on. So how do you get him onto the gurney? He's on the sked, and you guys have no, the no, 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 flat, no, no. Or? He wasn't. We didn't want to put him on the sked. Oh, you he's did. On, you he's on the, the stair, stair chair. Yeah, yeah okay. chair. I remember chair. too. They go, hey, we got the chair. You were saying the new generation. They're like, we got ah, the chair, yes. and I was like, oh, the chair. And I almost. I got up on my own that morning. It was the most, it was the heaviest lift I've ever done because I caught my hand on the side of the um, closet door 
and it took me one, two, and the final one, I was like, let's go, and like oh, lifted my myself God. up. And now I'm going up and down those same stairs with, um, you know, 53 pound um, Kettle kettlebells bells. in yeah. each hand. And I'm going, this is only 106 pounds. And I'm like, and this is pretty, you know, it's not impossible, but it, it ain't a bag of groceries, yeah. you know? And I'm like, I lifted up 500 pounds. It's right. just And for how blowing. long? And for how long did you do that, I was walking around like that very briefly, but I was walking around. So this is what I, was, I forgot to ask, too. Like, what time of day was this? It's like middle of the afternoon. Yeah. It's like four, yeah. four so in the afternoon. Like, it's like when you got to take a piss. Well, like, that's why I was wearing the sheet. Ah. Because the 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 first attempt, I was wearing these sweatpants and it didn't go well. Ah. So I just dropped the pants, probably dropped them in the bathroom, and then just sheeted it. I'm like, fuck it, that's that done. Yeah. Three sheets to the wind, <laughs> literally. Man, <laughs> yeah, man. So we got you know we got rich down. I think, and then the heavy lift shows up, and it's just one of the new flip down. It wasn't like your like your standard heavy lift gurney that that we have, because that's the other issue with those with the heavy lift gurneys. You could put that thing when you have somebody that that's that heavy, yeah, right. Like getting up this much to get on a seat uh, is a bitch, but also getting down that much right. to sit on a gurney that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. is a bitch oh yeah it's... so the good thing about the the old style of heavy lift gurney was you could put it halfway down you could leave it flat and put it halfway down a couple reasons why that was good that was usually good because however fat you were you could you could just turn and sit right back down okay sure. yeah yeah and also as we're taking 700 pounds down the sidewalk over cracks and stuff like that i'd rather that 700 pounds be here mm -hmm. than here high center ground. Right. right and that's why you guys asked me you said do you think you can walk down? And I go, I think I'm. I think I could. I and I really do think I could. But in my mind, I go, one wrong step, sure. and not yeah. only am I snapping my ankle and and I'm taking you guys. Oh, yeah. that, you know, it yeah. was. You got down to the bottom of the stairs too, and one guy I don't know who it was was like, "There's my workout for the day." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true, man. It's a it's a workout. Oof. Even when the patient is helping on their own and stuff, mm -hmm. you're still supporting oh, a lot of, a lot of weight yeah. when you're helping people down the stairs a like lot. that. See, um, that. So now we're to where you're getting into the gurney. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, at that point, the, all the hard work is done. Yeah. You know what I mean? At that point. Uh, there are situations where you know you'll have a patient that goes in cardiac arrest like that and stuff like that, which mm. has its own difficulties because now, now you're in the back of an ambulance with 700 pounds, right? Which takes yeah, up space, no space, yeah. you know. And then I'm six one to two two ten, you know. Um, the you know I've been I've been in the back there when with a heavy person cardiac arrest with my Steve Smith who works at six three is my partner. He's six four. You know, two eighty. There you go. It's tight in there. Totally. You know, and so, so it's a hairy situation. If something goes wrong, luckily with you, once we got you down, I yeah. think like the the worst worst of it, as far as our, our end of it, yeah, had passed. And he was in pretty good shape. To I mean, seven hundred twenty seven pounds aside, <laughs> in pretty good shape to begin with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vital, <laughs> vitals wise and everything, right. EKG wise, right. You know? But I'll bet that has a lot to do with with your outcome too, man. Is yeah. your history of being fit? Yeah you know, of exercising, of running marathons in the past. Yep. And just the psychology of knowing that you can do it. Yep. You know, having that in the back of your mind that that's something that you can do. For his body to be do. able to recover too. Yeah. Sure, he's yeah, done man. it so many times. Yeah. yeah. But but even but even just the that that first step shit, you know, when you're in that yeah. deep cuz cuz and I say this a lot to people, man. I get in a lot of arguments with people about political shit at work, right? Because I'm I'm about as liberal as they come, right? And that's <laughs> I we talk about all the time here. I'm like a unicorn on the fire department. You know, it's a pretty conservative yeah. organization. Uh it can't be underestimated how important hope is. Oh man. To 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 somebody who's in the depths like that, you know. You look around Venice, especially now, and we talked earlier about how how much Venice has changed over, um, you know, since ninety seven when mm -hmm. you got here. Fuck Ben graduated high school, Venice High in ninety seven. Did me, you 96, really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. You're right. Not, no, you're ninety no, six. I'm ninety seven. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's it's. I mean, you can't turn. You can't throw a rock without hitting a homeless person. Yeah. Um, and 
um, and with the homelessness comes drug abuse and alcoholism. It's all over the place. There's mm-hmm. empty bottles all over the place. There's needles, you know, everywhere and stuff like that. It's it's hard to pull yourself out of that situation if you don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Right. You know, it's hard to, um, it's hard to even create the thought of you can pull yourself out of where you were without ever having seen that in yourself in the past anyways. Like I can imagine if you were there without having done all that in the past, without having been fit, without having been, uh, you know, gone to college and had those experiences, but, but, but been a healthy person without having that in your mind to even create the spark of thinking that there's a possibility that you could do what you did for a lot of people that just doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, um, and I, you know, I give the analogy of the homeless because I, I talk to a lot of the homeless yeah. down there. You know, we run on them all the time and I always ask them, where are you from? You know, what you do for a living? How'd you wind up homeless? Right. And it's always some reason or another. Of course, there's some that just enjoy it, you know, enjoy mm-hmm. getting high or whatever, but there's always a reason. And then it comes to a point where they just have no hope. That's right. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah. the fuck am I going to do, man? I'm here. I'm stuck. I have nothing. I've, yeah. you know, it's, you know, I get five mm-hmm. bucks. It's like, what am I going to do? I can't start a business or get a suit or anything, I might as well get this rock and, right. and feel good about my life. And yeah, it's like, all right, there you go. fuck, I understand that yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah. yeah. And and my brother touched on it slightly. You know, I've gone through my own issues with with um with substance abuse uh in my past. And that was one of the things that I've always said helped helped me to pull out of it was my my wife who loves me to death and yeah. has been supportive uh, has been the biggest support system for me my kids, mm-hmm. you know, and just a, fam- a family that loves you and stuff like that. It's, but it's light at the end of the tunnel. Right. It's, it's a, it's something to go, fuck, I do have, what the fuck am I doing? Right. I do have that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me, so what straight. am I doing? Yeah, right. exactly. Mm-hmm. Or at least course correct. So that eventually you get to that point where you're straight right. because, because I'll tell you what, man, it does seem like there's no hope. Yeah. I mean, you hit a point where you where That's right. Where, and, um, I don't know if Carlos talked to you about this. We were in a vacation once in Mexico and um, uh, me and Carlos went on a little snorkel trip in the morning and the gal that was like the snorkel guide was like a straight up Mexican, uh, uh, Mayan, I mean, from the mountains. Her yes. name was even just straight Mayan and we're yeah. like, oh, so yeah. we're like kind of chatting with her, you know, and talking about Mexico and stuff and- Carlos tells me this after the fact, but he it, it was back at the time when I was you know fucking around and stuff and partying a lot, and he had asked her, "Hey, my brother is kind of like in this, seems like he's on like in this like spiral right now. Is there anything that I can do for him?" Because she, she had been talking about that being a medicine woman and wow. all this stuff, right? And mm-hmm. She basically told my brother like, "Some people just need to hit rock bottom," mm-hmm. yeah, you know. And he told me that not too long after the trip, and my reaction at the time was just like. Whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yep. okay, what the fuck ever, you yeah. know what I mean? Until. Until looking back at it and looking back at my entire, my, my whole story, it's true, man. I mean, I basically hit a point where it was just like, f- fuck. <laughs> I, yeah. it, 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 everyone's probably better off if if I if I die. That's right. The, you know, my my wife, my kids will be better off. They yep. got this money coming from here and this money coming from here. Yep. These man, people won't have the happens. hassle of me, the headache of me. There you go. And that those thoughts freely flow through your head, man. Right. On totally. a daily basis, all yep. throughout the day. Right. And and if you don't have even a sparkle of hope yep. at the end of the tunnel, I can see how that can in, just envelop you. Yeah. yeah. You know, and just completely stamp out your light. Um. So now, you're in the gurney, got to get to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So from there, you get to here. How? Yeah. How? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's wild is that. Um, on the when when they were doing the intake, so my best friend um, Lego David Rojas um, comes and meets me there, and um, they're asking the questions as they do the intake. And when you say the hope thing and the there, you know, when they asked me if I was uh, depressed, I said no, because I grew up. My mom's a drug and alcohol counselor and like a you know um, into psychology and all that and. In my mind, I'm not clinically depressed. I don't have that chemical imbalance, right. you know. So I said, "No, I'm not." You know, in my mind, I'm like, "Am I super, super sad?" You know, yeah. <laughs> like the saddest man yeah. in the world, yeah. probably. Yeah. 
but in my mind I'm like I'm not I'm not depressed and I have always had this kind of indefatigable thing in me you know what I mean so like if you don't have that naturally and then you pile up all the stuff pile on the life stuff it's yeah. like you know and if anyone can hear my story and be like I hope that if you hear a guy who says he was 727 pounds and dying and drinking a handle of vodka a day and came back that you're like actually you know what life isn't that bad like yeah. I I think I got a shot you know yeah, yeah. but yeah, so right. I'm I'm doing the intake and they're asking me questions and I'm coherent and I'm answering them and then the lights go out I can still hear but I can't see and I just remember the sound of what I now know is a is a CPAP machine, you uh -huh. know? And my last name is Trap. My best friend Lego calls me Trap, and he's going, Trap, Trap, come on, man, breathe, man, breathe. And I was negotiating with them, and I was like, all right, because that's gnarly. Like, I don't know if you've ever had one of those on you, but like a no. CPAP machine is like having a you know, like the gnarliest blast of air, like yeah. into your face and nose and mouth. And you, I just wanted yeah. to fight it. Yeah. So I would be like, all right, I'll, I'll do it for 30 seconds. I remember negotiate. It's so funny what you remember in those moments. So b real quick. Yeah. See a, a CPAP or BiPAP. It's a mass that has a soft, has a soft rim. It's so, it, it almost like it suctions. It's right. made to, to, to be shoved onto your face right. to seal around your face. And it's giving you positive pressure uh, uh, oxygen, okay? It's forcing, it's almost like a garden hose of That's air. Right. It shoves oxygen Forcing into it exactly into your lungs. It, a garden the, hose. the reason is, is when you have fluid backed up the way Rich did, that fluid, you, when your heart beats, it's pumping blood to two places. One, one side of your heart is pumping blood over to your lungs to pick up oxygen and bring it back to your heart. The other side is pumping it out through your aorta to the rest of your body, right. okay? When your blood pressure is that high, when you're when when everything is so backed up, uh, and you're so heavy, your blood pressure is so high that either your heart can't fight against the pressure that's in there, or your liver's you know got disease mm -hmm. from drinking so much that it can't filter shit out, mm -hmm. and fluid starts to back up, it will back up into your lungs. Okay, mm -hmm. when that happens, little air sacs at the very tip of your airways that fill up with air, where air exchange happens, those are now surrounded by fluid, yep. so you're not getting any air exchange. So, so you can be trying to breathe in, but those little air sacs, your alveoli, aren't filling up with air because they're being squished by fluid yeah. or they're filled up with fluid. Yep. So that CPAP forces air in so that when you go to take a breath, it's forcing air in and forcing air to fill up those alveoli, which is forcing the fluid out of the sacs, which allows gas exchange to happen, allows you to, to breathe, wow. basically. That's why they slapped it on you. Yeah, it, is so, a, it is a violent feeling you know what i mean it, especially it, no yeah. i have no visual context this is all right, yeah, sure, just yeah. sound scary. and feeling yeah and so from your end it's scary mm -hmm. it's dark it's loud mm -hmm. it's violent from my end you're dying because yep. you got fluid in your lungs and this is the only thing that's going to help you buddy so it used to be we used to sit behind somebody with a bvm mm. so you'd have somebody starving for air <laughs> and you'd have to get behind them with a bag valve mask and hold the mask on their face yourself wow. and tell them, listen to me, I'm going to help you breathe, okay? When when I say take a breath and you'd have to hold it away because the second you put it on their face- That's right. Oh, they want, wow. They, they want, you're suffocating them Jeez. at that point, right? Wow. So that's what he's fighting with at that point is yeah. that CPAP, which is trying to save your life, trying to force air yeah. in. And they're watching the oxygen levels. I remember he said it's going, you know, 80, 10, 6, 0, 6, 0, 5, 3, 0. Like, yeah. right, just not, it's just it's not place, getting yeah. in, you yeah. know? And they wanted to, I don't know the timeline, but eventually my mom gets there the next day. She flies in and they wanted to give me a tracheotomy because I just wasn't, my body was not accepting oxygen, oxygen. you know? Yeah. And, for whatever reason, you know, my mom said something about my voice and that she's like, you can't, you, you can't do that to yeah. her. And then they intubated me. So right. that's how I wake up. However many days later is tube down my throat and my hands strapped down. And when I tell people how I stopped drinking, 
I say, this is how hardcore I am. I had to have a tube shoved down my throat yeah, right? and literally my hands strapped down. And yeah. then I go, okay, I can, yeah. now, Fine. I, now I can stop, you know? Fine. I wish, and part of me goes, I wish this would have happened earlier, you yeah. know? But like you said, the, you know, the, that low moment, yeah. the worst moment of my life, you know, and the worst thing that ever happened to me is the best thing that ever happened to yeah, me. Yeah, man. It, mm-hmm. it, it had to happen. And like, the reason I called my account 727 Pound Marathon Man is not only two years after the date did I run a marathon, but to just get out in front of that number. You know, I've lived my life in shame. A huge part of my thing was shame and weight. And, sure. you know, it's always yo yoing. But if I just get ahead of it and just go, this is where it was, you know what I mean? Like, this is it. This yeah. that was me. It's like erasing some of that stigma to just go, you know, it, it was what it was. It's yeah, um it's amazing. It's funny man like um I've always been uh I've always been one to uh, admit mistakes. You know I'm the first one to admit when I make a mistake. Um I don't I I uh take accountability for everything in my life, you yeah. know. Um e- even if I don't at first, <laughs> uh eventually it comes out, but I think all that comes from from the struggle. Mm-hmm. And being in a in a low place and uh the whole gamut realizing that you, that you're you, that you can't do it on your own asking people for help accepting that help uh, and moving forward with with making yourself better so, going through something like that at least for me when shit comes up <laughs> whatever the hell it is throughout the day whatever dumb shit that that irritates most people or aggravates people or someone cuts you off or whatever the shit just doesn't get to me wow the same as as it as it feels like it has in other parts of my life or yep. early in my life, like it feels like shit just like rolls off my back a lot easier now. Or if there's difficulties, it's like nothing's ever going to be as difficult as that. Oh wow! As that, that's really pulling myself out of this hole. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Um, did you feel? Do you feel like that? that well, it's give, kind of giving your life that um, that little bit of yeah, a boost. Like, I mean, every day I wake up because when I. When I woke up and was intubated and I came back, you know, um, I still wasn't out of the woods. You know, they were telling they were telling my mom and all my I was just on the phone with my boy Buddha Black earlier. And he was one. I talk about the people in the room, you know, because I woke up and there was Lego Darius, my mom, Buddha Black, Russ Jones. And, you know, I have a community. You know what I mean? I have that thing. And like I still wasn't out of the woods. And I, you know when I finally realized that I was going to live, like I couldn't believe that I got a second chance, you know? Yeah. So right. every day I wake up with this and and it varies by degree, but I wake up with this thing of like, I can't believe I get to do it again. I can't, it, yeah. this is, and it is the ultimate gift. And I think part of that familiarity with death, you know, you said, uh, it's interesting. You said the Mayan and then your brother's Carlos yeah. So I read all these books by Carlos Castaneda about um, right. Don Juan and all this stuff. Uh-huh. And that's a yeah. huge part of my, just my zeitgeist and my philosophy. But Don Juan tells him at one point, in order to raise the stakes, in order to get him to get Carlos Castaneda to pay attention to life, he says, death is always uh, is always to the left of you. It's always on your left shoulder and you're never fast enough to catch it, but it's always there. He was just trying to get him to like realize how important this yeah. moment is. Sure, subjective yeah. time living. Yeah. And I don't know how, I don't know. I'm sure people get that organically and they can find that, but that was a gift that was given to me. You know, it was just handed to me this sure. grace that yeah, entered man. me at the hospital that was like, it ain't me. I'm not the one that saved myself. I make that call. And it's interesting to hear your perspective because I don't make that call because I don't want to bother you. I don't want to bother my local company, 63. I I don't want to, I don't want to be a burden on people. You know what I mean? And how many people have died because of their pride or their shame or their guilt? And I want to go to the hospital. I told my best friend's the one that saved my life because I said to him, I go, here's my thinking. I go, maybe you could have one of those um, donut inflatable things and I could get in your truck and we could go to an urgent care. And he goes, dude, he's like, you're not, you can't fit in my truck. Like, yeah, you got to make the call. And it never occurred to me that I could call someone and have them come and help me. You know, I was sure, like, yeah. I, I can go somewhere and maybe 
sit in a, no, like, what do you think? But like, that was the mentality. Sure, yeah. And to hear you say that that's what you do, you know, it's like, God, man, it just gives me so much respect for every time, you know, when I was training for the marathon, that's the reason why I snapped that, that picture of the, of the, um, what do you call it? The rig, the paramedic, the bus or whatever. Yeah. yeah the rig. rescue. The yeah. rescue. Um, yeah, let's put those pictures up, man, if we can, before we tune off. So I, uh, got a couple pics from your, uh, IG here. Yeah. Right? yeah. So yeah. when I was training for the marathon, every time that I got to, and that guy on the left is probably probably f mm, five, 500 pounds. I, I had lost a lot of water weight by yeah. then. And that, that was, I think that was at Rancho. Yeah. I'm a little, cl I'm a little cleaned up. Um, so I think that was at Rancho Los Amigos. So I was in the ICU for 10 days, um, at, at Cedar Sinai in a total of two weeks and then two weeks at Rancho. The next show. Um, <laughs> um. <laughs> but whenever, when I was training for the marathon, so at, crazy at the at oh yeah and that's that's at Cedar Sinai on the yeah. left um so that's still yeah that's pretty big um I would see the fire truck or the paramedic truck always at that moment where I'd be on sure. mile ten and I needed to get to eleven the truck would pass by it was the most bizarre thing we were talking about it earlier these coincidences sure, these god yeah. shots. Yeah. And every time, or I would run past the firehouse and I would just be like, bum, 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 yeah, bum, yeah, bum, yeah. bum, it would just get me so pumped get up, you, going, you know? Yeah. And I even came up, I saw some of you guys were out by the beach one day and I had been running and um, I came up to the guys and I, I was like choked up because I was like seeing the guys and I was like, I don't know if you remember me, but I was this guy. And they were like, no, yeah, like yeah. it just didn't click, you know, sure, yeah, but they yeah. were like, it could have been a different, I was like, crew. I just want to yeah. thank, but they were like, thank you. You sure, know what yeah, I mean? They yeah, were very right, cool about right, it, but right. it just didn't happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, but it's like, who, but that's yeah, but the now wild this part worked. about reconnecting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's social uh, you know, media <laughs> before, before we get done here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did want to mention just, just the, just what are the odds, man? It's you know amazing, what I mean. Yeah. It, it, when you when you realize the people that we know to get, uh, you know, mutual friends that we have, yeah. and just uh, just kind of the same, you know, we're both actors. Yeah. You know, we're both in that kind of industry, and yeah. just kind of on the outskirts of it and stuff. And then having these things that have, it's just funny how life works that way. We have my wife in here is our current episode that's out right now. Yeah. But it's just like me and her, you know, she she worked private ambulance and we met at the hospital. It's the only time we ever happened to be at the same hospital at the same time. I saw one, some of that clips. This one, little, yeah, this hey, one hey, time. Hey. Yeah, exactly. But it's you just funny know. how it's just funny wow. how how life life puts you in people's paths. Yep. You know, and you never know the impact that you're having on people. That's right. Um both ways. That's right. You know? Um there's been plenty of plenty of patients that I've had that have affected me, you know, good and bad. Right. So it's just a trip that um the, the entire story is a trip, man. Well and I wanted to uh, you know thank you personally on the show because how many times do you get to thank the guy who you literally saved my life. You know <laughs> what I mean? So like that's and then it happens here. It's yeah. a trip, man. Yeah. And I then, wish we had more than an hour. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I really do. Yeah, because what you were running marathons within two years. It's, yeah, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Two we years had to back, have to have you back on in twenty six point two. Yeah, so amazing. crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I can't tell you how happy I am for you, man, and uh, so how grateful. how just how good it felt to see your page and and read about everything that happened since the last time we met. And I'm really glad that you agreed to come on the show. Oh, you guys and, are amazing, with man. Us today. This is Appreciate absolute you, pleasure. Man. Where uh, can they follow you? Seven twenty seven pound marathon, man. On Instagram, oh, yeah. social media. and then yeah. F Future Ghost Brothers is the new uh, music project. If you want to check that out, I'll send you guys the track. Yeah, no, for right sure. On, send it to me, dude. <laughs> right on. Danny. Um, you can follow me at uh, Danny Gonzo thirty four on Instagram and Twitter. Follow me at Ben Nine Humor, Ben Number Nine Humor, like Benign Tumor on Instagram and Twitter. Follow the show at PRC Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Email us contact PRC Pod at gmail dot com. Shout follow out to uh, Brent Urban at Brent Urban does our. Um, theme music i haven't shouted him out in a while. oh yeah that was good yeah yeah, yeah that's some yeah, that's my, some flow is that a my custom neighbor. that's a custom yeah yeah, yeah, that's yeah right. he that's did it for good. the show yeah wow. he's freaking good man oh. brent urban it's at brent urban urbn on instagram what's Check up him brent out. holler man we got he's some really beats good. thank you guys all right. yeah hey. Hey. all right hey yeah i mean hey. hey uh please do remain calm about to run against it and with a little bit of soul, no times.